why should we care about pollinators? And so this is a, a pretty important topic. And the fact that you are all logged in and here to learn about this means that you guys probably already have some ideas about why we should care about pollinators. But let's go into a few of these. One, pollinators provide food for us. There are a lot of estimates in, in terms of uh, how much of what we eat is either directly or indirectly brought to us by pollinators. Um, especially bees. And here are just some examples of the types of foods that we rely on um, either directly from insect pollination or increased seed uh, production that we'll, we then uh, consume the vegetation from. Um, another really big aspect is the economic impact. So in the United States, agriculture is our largest industry and pollination services to U.S. agriculture is valued at over $20 billion annually. And the U.S. is one of the leading producers of quite a few different crops, um, including almonds. Um, and then within the U.S., there are lots of different regions that are heavily reliant on pollinators uh, for a lot of what they do agriculturally. But it's not just about us. So pollinators also um, support native plant communities that then provide food for wildlife. So um, deer, birds, rodents. <clears throat> other small animals all rely on these uh, pollinator products as well, in addition to us. So pollination is a really unique um, symbiosis, which means that there are um, two different organisms that are both benefiting from it. So in the, from the insect standpoint, the insect gets food. Um, and the plant standpoint, the plant increases their probability of successful reproduction and um, successful uh, seed set. So flowers also have kind of adapted to change the way that they look, change their anatomy, change their physiology to better attract certain types of pollinators that are then able to successfully accomplish those needs of those specific plants. And then in addition, flowers like to make things a little bit easier for their pollinators as well. So bees can see certain colors better than others. And an example of this is bees can see the UV spectrum. And so bee pollinated flowers, if you look at them under a black light, look very different than they would to us. They have these little guides, these little lines that lead right to the source of where the nectar would be in the flower. These are called nectar guides. And so bees are able to land on that flower and able to follow those lines down to the source of the nectar. And then flowers that are heavily reliant on um, insects that, are, um, that don't have long mouth parts um, are going to be shallower or have their nectar closer to the surface or have their pollen more readily accessible. So those types of insects are able to access these flowers um, and therefore these flowers um, are um, encouraged to continue to provide this food source in a way that it's easier for these animals to access. Some pollinators are generalists, which means that a single species would visit a variety of different types of plants. And a classic example of this is the honeybee. The honeybee will visit and pollinate a lot of different types of flowers. But some pollinators are extremely specialized. And so you can have one species of bee that is specifically um, linked to one species of flower and their timings are usually synced up so that when those um, bees emerge, those flowers would also already be present and ready to be pollinated. And then some uh, plants will go one step further and make this an interesting um, strategy to try and trick these insects into visiting them by mimicking either um, female bees or uh, by releasing pheromones that match those of female bees that will then trick these male bees into coming to that flower and trying to mate with it, which will then unlatch the pollen um, from those specific flowers. So there are some very interesting pollinator and plant interactions out there, but there are a lot that we still don't know fully about. 80% of plant species, so 80% of all the types of plants on our planet depend on animals for pollination. And out of all of these, bees are the most important pollinators of all. And you might have some guesses as to why, and you'd probably be right. 
But one of the main reasons why bees are the most important pollinators is the fact that they have these hairs covering their body. Lots of insects and lots of other animals do have these hairs, but what makes bees unique is that they have these branched hairs. Um, these branched hairs are not only much better at um, capturing pollen grains, um, they're also able to transport larger quantities of these pollen grains um, to, from one flower to the next. And so depending on the type of bee you're looking at, the concentration of these branched hairs um, are going to be located in different parts of their body. An example on the bottom left-hand side in that picture is a mason bee or a leafcutter bee. Those types of bees have those branched hairs on the underside of their abdomen. So you can notice that on the pollen that they're packing right underneath there. And then on the picture on the bottom right, you have a honeybee. They have these specific pollen baskets called corbicula, which have the concentration of those branched hairs in which they'll pack the pollen. And so different types of bees can often be identified into their various groups based on where these hairs are located on their bodies. The most famous example of a pollinator um, and the most famous bee of all is the honeybee. Um, and that's because we've had an association with honeybees for, um, for, you know, humans have been managing them since uh, ancient Egyptian times and earlier. And you can find evidence of this in um, old archaeological sites and in hieroglyphics. Um, but honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought to North America by European settlers in the early 1600s. That doesn't mean that we don't have our own set of bees here. Besides honeybees, the United States is home to more than 3,600 species of native bees. So there are lots of other bee species out there that are um, accomplishing a lot of these pollination tasks and flying under the radar um, and not usually uh, recognized or well understood for the roles that they play in the ecosystem. Worldwide, there is an estimated um, over 20,000 different species of bees present, and out of those, honeybees only make up about seven different species. So there are a lot of these other native bees around that are um, pretty critical for pollination of a variety of different crops and a variety of different native plants that exist. I've grouped these bees into four main groups that you would recognize in your backyard. So these aren't um, all encompassing. This does not include every single family of bee, but these are four main groups that you would likely see in your landscapes. So that includes bumblebees. Um, the, they are in the same family as honeybees are. Mason and leafcutter bees. Then on the bottom left, you have sweat bees. These are amongst the smallest that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and um, these are pretty small and iridescent, and if you take a close look at flowers and just watch them for a while, you're going to notice these bees. And then mining bees. So these are just four main groups of bees that you are likely to see in your landscapes. If you are interested in learning more about how to identify these pollinators or learn more about these groups of pollinators and the roles that they play in their environment, I recommend that you visit some of the resources that I'm going to share at the end of this presentation. There are a lot of great resources available um, and a lot of state-specific resources available for you to be able to identify the pollinators in your backyard. So now we get to the, the slightly alarming part of this presentation. Um, we know that bees are on the decline, and we're, we know this because we are noticing um, smaller uh, populations of bees in areas where they were abundant, and we are noticing um, bees disappearing from taxonomic records. So scientists that have been collecting and tracking populations of different bee species are not noticing certain bees that are usually collected every year. So why are these bees declining? For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on native bees um, because the situation with honeybees is very complex. And so I'm going to focus on why all of these bees are declining. And there are two main reasons that are contributing to the decline of these native bees. One, is certain pest management practices. And we're gonna go into ways that you can better your backyard pest management strategies 
to make them more pollinator friendly and to make them safer for other beneficial insects in your landscape as well. And then arguably one of the most significant contributors to native bee decline is habitat loss. A lot of green and natural and wild spaces are being converted into hardscapes and asphalt and neighborhoods and cities. And so that reduces the amount of area for nesting habitat and the amount of area for food resources for these native pollinators. Same can be said for um, uniform agricultural land that doesn't have any strips or buffers in between. You have a high disturbance environment in which pollinators wouldn't be able to thrive. So I'm going to talk about some things that you can do in your landscapes to help pollinators. So what can we do about it? There are a lot of little things that you can do. And one of the most important parts of this I'm going to discuss at the end um, is going to be to continue to learn because information is continuing to be developed by scientists on how we can best preserve and protect these pollinators. So what do bees need? Bees need three main things. They need a low chemical input, they need food, and they need a place to live. And so this is pretty similar to what humans need. You need a place to live, you need food, and you need a healthy environment. So we're going to go into these uh, specifically. So starting with the low chemical input, um, something that people are often surprised to learn is that 70% of pesticide use is for aesthetic reasons. And so this is for landscaping reasons and reasons that don't necessarily affect the health of the plants involved. And so we are applying a lot of pesticides in situations in which they may not be needed. In addition to that, over 99% of all the critters in your landscape, in your gardens, all your arthropods and insects, um, your you know worms, spiders, all of them, out of, out of all of the ones that are pests, probably 100 times more are beneficial or are doing, just playing their role in the ecosystem without causing any harm. So 99% of these critters in your gardens are beneficial. So we want to keep this in mind when we go about our pest management strategies, because not only do we want to protect our bees, we also want to protect the other beneficial insects that are in our landscapes and part of those ecosystems. So we're going to talk about ways that you can safeguard bees when you're using insecticides. So one is following label precautions. It is very important. In fact, it's critical to read the labels of any product before you apply it in your landscape. Read it thoroughly because they have a lot of detailed instructions in that label that talk about how and when you are allowed to and recommended to apply it. In 2013, the EPA implemented this bee hazard label and this bee advisory box, which basically looks like a little red diamond with a bee in it. And this is required to be placed on registered products that have any potential negative impact on pollinators, um, especially bees. And there's a lot of research that's continuing um, on where more and more products are being um, addressed in terms of their potential impact on pollinators and other beneficial insects. So keep an eye out for this label in the back of your product. Just because it has the label doesn't mean that you can't use that product. You just need to be cognizant of how to use that product to minimize the negative impact on those beneficial insects. Another way to minimize any sort of um, negative impact on bees when you are utilizing insecticides is to not overspray plants in bloom, which means do not spray plants that are currently blooming with a pesticide. Um, this is pretty important um, because not only is this going to protect those um, pollinators that would be visiting those nectar. Uh, nectar and pollen resources, it's also going to protect other beneficial insects that are going to be visiting those flowers. Um, in addition, if you read product labels, which is required, it's mandatory, you can't get around this, um, 
it will say not to apply an insecticide on a flower or plant that is currently blooming. So it's important to read those labels and not to overspray plants in bloom. And then other best management practices include knowing when to spray. So avoid spraying on windy days in which you can have off-target effects, so in which your pesticide application can drift onto plants that you didn't intend it to reach. So think about those when you are going out to treat a pest problem in your landscape. Think about the types of products that you have available to you as well. If you are applying grub treatments or weed and free feed treatment in your lawn and you have lawn weeds, applying sprays versus granular applications of those products can have different impacts. If you are applying sprays and you have lawn weeds, um, you're going to impact those populations of bees in a negative way. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how that happens. Um, and then if you are utilizing granular applications of weed and feed uh, in which you apply them at, in little pelletized form and then you water them down, that reduces potential contamination of the nectar and pollen resources in those lawn weeds that bees are reliant on. In addition, um, one thing that's recommended is to mow or prune off oversprayed blooms. So if you couldn't get around the fact that you needed to apply a product and you do have a plant that's going to be blooming soon or is currently in bloom, you want to remove those blooms. You want to minimize any sort of interaction between pollinators and those, um, those insecticides that you have utilized in your landscape. So one example of this is also systemic insecticides. Systemic insecticides are something that you either apply through a, an injection into the plant or at the base of the plant in which that product is taken up into the tissues of the plant and spread around. And it's utilized for treating a variety of different insect pests that can be persistent and difficult to manage in other ways. And so if you're using systemic insecticides, it's usually a good idea to prune those plants um, and remove the blooms after you've applied this product or wait until after the blooms have been spent before you apply these products. Another thing that's important to note is that you want to mow your um, lawn weeds. Remove those flower heads from your lawn weeds before you apply grub treatments or weed treatments in your lawn because you don't want to create those bee hazards where you have uh, flowers that are contaminated with insecticides or herbicides that can potentially have a negative impact on pollinators. And then lastly, in, in utilizing insecticides, consider products that are relatively non-hazardous to bees or product alternatives. Um, and examples of these can include things that have a lower um, uh, a lower residual activity, which means that they are only active um, for a short amount of time and are important in controlling certain pests specifically to the time that they are active. But that being said, one of the most important aspects of insecticides is something that I continue to try and educate people about is to remember that just because something is natural or naturally derived or organic, does not mean it's safe and vice versa. Just because something is a conventional insecticide or synthetically derived does not mean that it is always going to be the more harmful option. This is why reading and following the label is pretty critical in trying to determine whether that product is going to be suitable for your needs and also going to be the least impactful, least negatively impactful product for the pollinators in your landscape. In terms of getting going around, um, uh, you know, utilizing some of these products, know when to spray and if it's worth the risk to bees. So think about what your pest problem is and think about whether you need that intervention of insecticides um, or whether that is even going to work in these situations. Think about whether those can be managed in different ways by either encouraging beneficial insects in your landscapes that will then um, continue to accomplish biological control by handpicking pests if you have six you know, tomato plants that you're trying to keep your tomato hornworms off of, 
picking them off or scrubbing scale insects off of your small um, woody ornamentals or pruning off your fall webworm nests before they um, before they get out of those nests and start to feed on those those branches. Think about ways that you can exclude pests from your plants by putting netting or covers on them and minimize that need to apply those insecticides, um, which will then be great for, for a lot of the organisms in your landscape that are, are just part of the ecosystem and going about their pest management practices and helping you in achieving your goals. The other two things that bees need are food and nesting habitat. And both of these go hand in hand um, because the, the more amount of nest sites that you have, and these include things like undisturbed soil, access to that soil, old stems, um, spent flowers, rodent burrows, compost piles, constructed nests, um, all of these. The greater amount of these nesting sites that you create in any landscape, and then if you add that to floral resources, the more you do in any given landscape creates that perfect little center part of this Venn diagram that is an ideal location for pollinators. So you have areas that overlap that have really great nesting sites in addition to great floral resources for pollinators. And the more that you have these overlapping, the better that environment is for pollinators in your landscape. So we're going to go into some of these slightly more specifically, but I'd like to preface this by saying if you have specific questions about certain plant species or plant recommendations for pollinators, those can vary um, based on the region that you're in, but I'm going to share resources at the end of this presentation in which you can access detailed plant lists that go into um, which pollinators they attract, what types of uh, ecosystems and environments they will uh, thrive in, and recommendations on what you can plant and where you can plant it. And so um, it will be difficult to address that for each specific area um, in, in the scope of this talk, but there are a lot of resources available where you can access this specific information. So going into some of uh, the general requirements, for food for bees, you want to provide food resources in your landscape. And this doesn't mean that you plant everything that's going to be blooming at the same time in June and July. You want to make sure that you're providing a diversity of plant resources because we talked about those specialist pollinators or pollinators that have very specific interactions with certain groups of plants or certain species of plants even. And so a diversity of plant species that are going to have succession of bloom times all the way from very early in the spring, the first things that pop out and start to bloom and flower, um, all the way through into the fall when that last um, set of flowers are around because pollinators are going to be around throughout that growing season and different groups of pollinators need floral resources at different times of that growing season. So it's important to have something in bloom at all times. And not only is this great for pollinators, this is also going to be really beneficial for you when you look out into your backyard or into your pollinator patch and see a beautiful touch of color and a beautiful set of flowers in your landscape. So um, now we're going to talk about nesting habitat, and this is where I'm going to go into a little bit more detail because there are quite a few things that you can do to encourage pollinators in your landscape by creating uh, a habitat that's going to be beneficial and a habitat that's going to be inviting to pollinators um, and encourage them to utilize your landscape and then continue to um, stay in your landscape pending the fact that you manage your pest problems effectively. So there are two main groups of nesting bees, um, ground nesting bees and cavity nesting bees. And ground nesting bees make up a majority of the species of bees. So 70% of these species nest in the ground. And 30% of these species are cavity nesting. And a famous example of a cavity nesting bee is the honeybee. Honeybees nest in hives or, and previously would nest in old tree trunks, in, in um, small cave openings, things like that. So um, we've grouped bees into these two categories, and I'm going to talk about habitat specific to both of these. 
Now, if you look at pollinators, and we're talking about urban and suburban environments specifically for this talk, you see this industrialization and urbanization across the board. Lots of places that had expanses of open green and wild areas are being replaced by more industrial areas, neighborhoods, um, uh, you know, places that have less and less of that natural area available. So if you were a pollinator and you were looking at um, a landscape that looked like this, there isn't very much that you can access in this landscape that will give you a nice place to nest and a nice source of floral resources that you can feed on over the course of the growing season. So we're going to talk about how you can utilize the areas in which you live, um, whether that is in a dense urban environment or a more suburban environment, and even going into the rural environment, these little things that you do to create this habitat and floral resource in your landscape is going to be very, very beneficial for those pollinators, especially bees, that are going to be still present in those urban areas. So we're going to start with the ground nesting bees. There are two main groups of ground nesting bees, and most of them dig out their own nests, but quite a few will utilize existing holes as well. So that includes things like bumblebees, which will utilize old rodent burrows um, or kind of um, old crevices and sunken in areas of soil in your landscape. So talking a little bit about these habitat um, spots for these ground nesting bees, if you're looking at this, um, a lot of gardeners will say, wow, that's beautiful. And it is. It looks really great. But one of the problems that I see in this landscape, one, is the, the absence of floral resources in what has been planted at this time in the season. There isn't very much that looks like it's flowering at all. But secondly, that mulch on the ground. So large amounts of mulch are going to be a physical barrier for ground nesting bees to find a place to nest and to get to that nest spot. So... Mulch has a lot of different, different purposes and a lot of great purposes, but that doesn't mean that you need to mulch every square inch of bare soil in your landscape. So what I recommend if you have um, you know, a landscape that you want to mulch, leave bare soil, leave patches of bare soil, whether it's behind your shrubs, behind your plants, um, leave these patches of bare soil for bees and leave them undisturbed and just let them let them remain that way without um, without adding those additional barriers um, for bees to be able to access nesting areas or nesting sites um, that they can then utilize. Another um, major thing to consider is think about your lawns and think about your lawns in a way that you might be able to create a little refuge for pollinators. So an ideal home lawn in the United States looks like this picture. Very few people that I've ever met have lawns that actually look like this, but we all aspire to have this beautiful, dense green lawn in our landscape. Here are just examples of what would be considered good lawns in urban and suburban environments where you have these beautiful lawns, weed-free, um, look clean and just pristine. And then here are examples of what my lawn would look like probably, but also lawns that are considered less than ideal or might make you um, the outcast of your HOA or neighborhood association in your landscape. So these are considered lawns that are unpleasant and unattractive um, in a landscape. So Research from the University of Kentucky found that lawn weeds can be a critical component of food sources for pollinators, especially bees, in these suburban landscapes. So they found 37 species of bees that were feeding specifically on clover and dandelions in lawns um, in these yards, backyards and front yards in the state of Kentucky. And so... This goes to show that these lawn weeds, and there's a lot of other research that, that sh has shown this in other places across um, the country, there are a lot of different functions for these lawn weeds like dandelion, like clover in your lawns, 
in which they are a really great source of food for these pollinators. So these lawn weeds can act um, as little stepping stones between remnants of natural habitat that might exist, which is getting sparser and sparser. And lawns are some of the most um, ubiquitous green spaces that you can find in any given area and the largest irrigated crop in the world. And so there is a lot of room and physical space that you have available to you to make it a more inviting environment for pollinators, especially bees. Another unique thing about these lawn weeds is that things like dandelion and things like clover are usually some of the first things to spring up in, in terms of floral resources and some of the most consistent and uniform resources that are available in any given area. So you're going to have a variety of different dandelions throughout a growing season, and they're also going to persist later in the year if you have certain types of clover available. So these can help sustain populations of urban bees in your landscape. So what can you do to help bees in your landscape when it comes to your lawn management strategy, strategies? So I'm not saying, you know, just go absolutely wild and stop caring about your lawn, but consider what level of lawn excellence you want to maintain and what you're willing to accept and overlook in terms of that, you know, small patch of dandelions or those patches of clover in your landscape. And I know a lot of people that have um, HOAs um, to answer to, um, you're probably going to need to do some educating and, and talk to them about the, the function of some of these lawn weeds in their support for a lot of these urban pollinators. Another thing that you can do if you don't want to specifically have a, a yard that's filled with dandelions is consider bee-friendly lawn alternatives that minimize that hazard to bees. So that minimize that potential trap for pollinators if you are applying insecticides in your landscape for grubs. Think about swapping out your turf for certain other types of um, lawn alternatives. So an example of this can be um, micro clover or clover lawns. And there's a lot of research in which you can find varieties of this for various um, types of ecosystems. But micro clover is just a smaller variant of clover that grows shorter. You can mow it the same way as lawns and it will also flower and provide a food source for bees. And it stays green and adds nutrients back into the soil. Or you can consider rock lawns with little patches of floral resources that create those nesting habitat and um, minimize that potential input in terms of managing specific areas for lawn pests and lawn weeds. So think about bee-friendly lawn alternatives as a potential to reduce the amount of work that you have to put in and reduce the amount of inputs that you have in terms of pesticides for your lawns. Now we're going to talk about the 30% of bee species that are cavity nesting. And again, I'm going to focus on um, solitary bees or native bees and not honeybees specifically. So what can you do to help these cavity nesting bees? One of the most important things is obviously the floral resources, but ways that you can keep and retain these populations in your landscapes is by providing nesting structures for these bees. You can either build these nesting structures yourself or buy these nesting structures from a variety of different sources. Um, and this can be as intensive of a project um, or as hands-off as you are comfortable with. But a few things to keep in mind when you are looking at nesting structures for these cavity nesting bees, um, think about nesting materials. You want these materials to be made of cardboard or bamboo. You don't want to utilize plastic straws because that um, minimizes ventilation and can increase disease presence in these little um, nesting tubes that bees will use. Um, you can also create drilled wooden blocks. So it's important to utilize untreated wood if you're doing this and maintain a depth of about four to eight inches deep because really shallow um, sources aren't ideal for, for bees and they, they will likely be um, 
they will likely be encouraged to not use that um, nest. So you want those bees to utilize um, nests in a way that is efficient for them and their resources. So having them about four to eight inches deep and varying diameter. So depending on the type of bee um, that uh, is going to be utilizing these cavities, you're gonna have different requirements in terms of the diameter of these tubes. And then you also want to include things like bundles of twigs, um, brambles and branches in a section um, because a lot of bees will utilize these little crevices between these bundles of twig, uh, twigs to build their nests in here. Um, there, oops, um, so there are lots of different styles, shapes, designs, and materials that are available when you're looking at these bee nests or um, when you're looking at building these bee nests, and you can purchase a lot of these. An important thing to know when you're thinking about the specifics of these nesting bees, I would recommend that you look online at some of the resources that I'm going to bring up at the end. They go into great detail as to the exact diameter requirements and the types of bees that are going to visit the the depth and diameter of certain sizes of these cavities in your bee hotels or bee houses. So um, otherwise it would take too long to talk about that specifically now, but th those resources and that literature is readily available and you can make this as involved an endeavor as you would like to. So now I'm going to summarize most of what I've talked about so far. Um, and just kind of reiterate some of the most important aspects of this and then leave some time for questions for you guys. So what can you do to help pollinators? You want to practice IPM, which is integrated pest management, utilizing a variety of different strategies to meet your pest control and management needs while also being cognizant of those beneficial insects in your landscape and knowing when to spray and if that's worth the hazard to those bees or those beneficial insects. Think about potential alternatives to managing the situation um, and think about ways that you can reduce the need for insecticide use by preventing pest problems before they get out of hand. Another critical aspect is to read and follow label directions and that also includes not spraying flowers in bloom. So if you have flowers that are currently blooming or that are going to bloom a short period of time, like a week or two after you apply a certain product, especially if that product has a longer residual, um, uh, which means that it's going to stay active on that plant for um, a certain period of time, you do not want to apply that to things that are going to bloom. And if you do, you want to remove those blooms um, or you want to prune that plant so that it misses that bloom time and minimizes that potential hazard with pollinators. Providing floral resources, which includes a variety of different plants of different colors, textures, shapes, and sizes in your landscape, and plants that are going to be blooming throughout the growing season all the way from the very early in the spring through late into the fall, is also another critical component of creating a pollinator-friendly landscape in your um, neighborhoods, in your backyards, in your cities, in your towns. Think about an alternative lawn, um, which could include something like Dutch clover or micro clover, where you have a variety, where you still have that, um, if you have that need or desire to have that little green space, you can have something that has a dual purpose by flowering and also providing food for pollinators and minimizing the impact um, of the and need for potential pest control um, for uh, lawn pests specifically. And then provide nesting habitat. So leaving bare soil in areas in your landscape for these ground nesting bees and providing next nesting structures in your landscape for the cavity nesting bees and also um, holding off or scaling back your fall cleanup um, at, by leaving some stalks and leaves in your landscape, not fully um, mowing plants all the way to the ground um, as soon as they're spent, leaving that wintering habitat that not only serves a, a, 
a role for pollinators, also serves a role for beneficial insects that are overwintering in your landscape. So hold off on some of that fall cleanup and um, leave those areas of potential habitat for pollinators. Another thing that you can do is create a pollinator patch. So devote a small space in your yard as designated pollinator habitat. And I've lived in apartments most of my life, so you don't need to have a backyard to be able to do this. You can set up a little community garden or a neighborhood garden, or you can even have potted plants that are going to be blooming at different times of the growing season that are there specifically for pollinators. There are, um, there is a lot of data to show that urban pollinators, um, which there are abundant species of bees that are found in urban areas, they have very limited resources available to them. So any little um, pollinator patch or, or pollinator planting that you incorporate can have a potentially significant effect on these bees in these urban areas. And then this is one of my favorite things to talk about, mullet gardens. Um, because a lot of people do live in places where they have uh, HOAs or neighborhood associations with rules in terms of what their landscape can and cannot look like. And so mullet gardens can be that perfect way where you have that beautifully manicured lawn in your front yard, so your business in the front, and you have that wild pollinator-friendly habitat in your backyard or patches of pollinator habitat um, in your backyard that creates that, that source for pollinators or that pollinator party in the back out of the, the prying eyes of anyone in your neighborhood that wouldn't want to see these lawn weeds or just a dense um, area of pollinator friendly uh, plants in your landscape. So here are some of the pollinator resources that um, I refer to very frequently. And one of my favorites include the Xerces Society, which is xerces.org, or the Pollinator Partnership, which is pollinator.org. These two have a variety of different resources in terms of literature, plant lists, habitat lists, and different tips on how to protect and preserve pollinators in your landscape, in addition to identifying bees and backyard bees and how you go about determining the type of pollinators that you have in your landscape. Um, the NRCS and the ARS also are great resources for some of the current and ongoing pollinator research. Um, and also, you can reach out to your land-grant institutions or your local extension offices um, where they can refer you to more local resources in terms of pollinator plants and pollinator education in your area specifically.